challenge I wanted to show you because uh, I think it really helps to visualize what we're seeing here is this is the bone marrow and this is the one cell that we're trying to target for one in a million there might be thousands of them, of them lying around the body and we find a way to get rid of them and only them without any other peripheral toxicity. So how are we going to do that? The lab takes a number of different approaches but I wanted to tell you about one of them because I thought it's a really cool story about how uh, Candace over there asked a really basic question uh, that many of other people had observed what she had observed and nobody had actually bothered to ask why. We asked why, we didn't know it was going to end up helping people, but the answer I think is it's absolutely going to end up helping people. And the question was this, so you can see that cell right now, not because we stained it with a breast cancer marker, but because we used a protein from a jellyfish called green fluorescent protein. I read about it. Yeah. <laughs> it was awarded a Nobel Prize and it's a big deal because you can take a gene. Uh, from jellyfish, you can put it in a cell and it'll fluoresce green. What a name. Um, and the problem is when you put these cells into a mouse with a full immune system, this is what happens. The tumor, instead of forming, after about a week, uh -huh. it starts getting attacked and they disappear. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people, they go, well, this is an artifact, I'm going to find a way around this, I want my experiments to work, and they don't care. Candace said, this is unacceptable. People's experiments are being tainted by this. We need to figure out what's going on. And so we had this profound immune response, and we figured out that it was due to that green fluorescent protein. And so Candace solved that problem. We found a way around it. But in the meantime, we thought, well, there's a silver line. We have a tumor forming in a mouse. Mm -hmm. We have a profound immune response against that tumor. What's happening to these cells as they leave the mammary gland of that mouse and start going to the other parts of the body are they still going to be there, or are they going to survive? And if so, how are they evading that immune response? Can we figure that out? And if we can, can we get around it and actually start killing the cells? So this is what that looks like. This is the lung. This is a single one of these cells that left that mammary gland and went into the lung. Mm -hmm. And we looked at all these exotic ways it could be evading immunity, and the answer turned out to be remarkably simple. It's a numbers game. So this population is one in a million. The immune cells that are meant to detect it are one in a million. And if you want two one in a million populations to interact and interact time and time again, it's like trying to win lottery again and again and again. And it's just not going to happen. So these are the cells that are specific to that tumor. And you can tell they're close, but they're just not close enough to get rid of it. So how are we going to how are we going to solve that problem? Well, it turns out you know we work with Stan Riddell, who uh, your husband was here last time visiting with. Yeah. Uh, we can boost immunity. We can up the number of antigen specific T cells. The T cells are indirect that can detect that tumor cell, we can do it through vaccination, we can do it by engineering T cells, and when we do so, we can tilt that numbers game into a face. And so what does that look like? So Ian over there took this video. Here's our dormant cell. Those magenta guys are, are the immune cell. They're flying around and they latch on, and then they start calling their friends. And the tumor gets around here. So this is great, but it's a green fluorescent protein that you're not going to have in a breast cancer patient. 
how are we going to actually make this apply to people? Well, there's two hypotheses that come out of this work. So one is that the immune response to the breast tumor, if it transmits to the bone marrow and elsewhere, it dictates who's going to have these cells lying around their body and whether or not they're going to wake up. The second is for the people who don't have that response, and only the people who don't have that response, can we engineer it to help them? So someone with breast cancer who doesn't have a strong enough immune response to their breast tumor, can we boost that response through vaccination, through uh, engineering T cells, and start getting rid of these cells, get their, get rid of all these dormant cells so they don't get passes down the road. So what this did was turn into a, a project now that's gonna involve 900 uh, patients where we're getting their bone marrow at time of surgery, we're looking for these dormant cells, we're profiling their immune systems, and we're defining up front who has a stronger immune response to their breast tumor and who doesn't. Does that predict who will recur and who won't? And for those people who don't have a strong immune response, we're profiling these tumor cells out of their bone marrow figuring out what's on their surface and unique to that surface and engineering immunity against them. So this is a project that involves multiple cancer centers, epidemiologists, immunologists, oncologists, but I think what's also really cool about it is from the inception, you know, we've worked with Fran Visco from the National Breast Cancer Coalition, and we have advocates who are involved in this project from stage one, from step one, and you're gonna meet some of them, I think, later on today, Terry Palastro and uh, Linda Weatherford as well. And so this is a project that was a combination of science combination of advocacy and you know what we're basically geared up to do now is, is profile all the cells out of people and start actually taking this from something that is doing really well in a mouse against the protein, the screen fluorescent protein and start making it work in people. And so what I thought would be kind of cool is uh, Sydney has been looking through these bone marrow aspirates from breast cancer patients and can show you what this actually looks like in a person's bone marrow and what these cells look like. So, here we have this patient set up for you. So this is one of our actual patient samples that we have here on the microscope. Yeah, I can bring some care lights. Yeah, so you can see the various colors of the cells, and these cells that are staying red right here are actually the cytokeratin positive cells, which are the epithelial cells, and those are cells that are not naturally found in the bone marrow, and so that's a marker of this cell that has come from this breast tumor and disseminated to the bone marrow. And with that, with that, we're able to see patients that have these disseminated tumor cells. And in Sydney, Miles Labs developing approaches to capture these little things that can profile some of these cells. Miles, come see. And John, you should come see too because you're doing the cancer work. We need to see what it yeah, looks like. Yeah, go ahead. Like. <laughs> John, come on. Oh. So this, yeah, so this is now turned into a $38 million consortium funded by the DOD. Uh, where, like I said, we're taking samples from 900 patients. Yeah. We're doing all kinds of biology, fundamental immunology, but we're now doing some context of humans. Yeah, go ahead. Take a look. And, you know, uh, success is, is the only thing we're thinking about, right? And so yeah. even if we're 100% successful, we're going to be able to prevent metastases. And the other thing that we're thinking about is what do we do for 10% of all breast cancer patients? Many other cancer patients who walk in the door already stage four, already with metastatic disease. Yeah. And so Tom uh, wrote the wrote the blank check, and uh, we're one of the first cancer centers to have a center for research excellence focused entirely on metastasis. We're going to leverage all of the interdisciplinary talent here at the Hutch, people who work on cancer, people who don't, neuroscientists, immunologists, everybody across the gamut, patient advocates from the inception, and we're going to take blue sky approaches to find not just better therapies from metastases, but curative um, approaches for metastases. And that's what it does. Cyrus is being a bit more honest, but one of the incredible things it does is train the next generation of scientists. You probably don't believe, okay, but this is how many months in? Just a couple, uh, just over a year. Just a year in, and she was able to do that for you, okay? Which just tells you the remarkable training that happens after graduate students, postdocs, Undergraduate students, really remarkable. So it's all part of it. You know what? The press should take their <laughs> pictures <laughs> because yeah. they are the oh, secret no. weapons. Right. You know, I'm just yeah. like the, you know, the <laughs> magnifying the message. Oh, come on, guys. No, I know. Look, you're making really this happen. Yeah. You're giving people hope. <laughs> the press needs to see you. That's great. Thanks. Thanks. Can I get a picture of y'all? Yeah. Yes. yes. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Thank you. No, thank you. My gosh. I mean, I, you know, had so many friends who had breast cancer, and um, 
1991, I started the Biden Breast Cancer Initiative, and we went into high schools, and we talked to young girls about how to do breast self-exam, and, and then, uh, you know, so that they take the message home to their mothers and their grandmoms, and, and so that they would be conscious of their health and, and do breast self-exams. And, uh, you know, that's what we have to do. I mean, it's all about prevention, I think, and uh, getting it early, because when, it, you know, as you well know, yeah, and this is all about prevention in the metastasis yeah. space, right? So yes. preventing metastases. So even if somebody does get diagnosed with that early stage cancer, and the story ended there, great. So yeah. how can we just stop that cancer from occurring? Yeah. yeah preventing from dying. Yeah. And thank you. All supported by the NIH. <laughs> by the moonshot. <laughs> yes. It makes an enormous difference. It really does. Well, you know how personal it is. Yeah. Yeah. It makes a huge difference. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. And thank you to the press for covering it, because yeah. otherwise the public's not going to know about this. And if somebody is diagnosed with breast cancer or has it right now, they need to hear this, that there is hope for them. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Great. And I'm sorry, would you tell me your name? Sure, I'm, my name is Cyrus Gajar. I'm a professor in the Public Health Sciences Division and the Human Biology Division here at the Hutch. Is that Dr. Gajar? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, doctor, you were talking about this with the first lady here. Uh, it looks like, it sounds like, by profiling these cells in patients, you're able to, or will be able to tailor a treatment for each patient. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, what we're trying to do is, you know, breast cancer in the breast isn't what leads to the vast majority of breast cancer lethality. It's the cells that leave the breast and sit dormant in other organs. At some point, a fraction of these cells wake up, and that's what causes cancer lethality. It's an unexploited window of opportunity, and it's one where we want to actually profile what's on the surface of these cells, find commonalities related to their biology, what enables them to survive in these other organs, what enables them to persist for years, if not decades, and then engineer immunity against these cells by understanding their surface profiles. That is incredible. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah. What a remarkable culture of committing ourselves to doing research. And finally, what science that, that the First Lady just saw in Dr. Cyrus Gajar's lab is the kind of science that's going to make a difference for our patients moving forward. We could not be more proud here at the Fresh Hunch to welcome the First Lady of the United States, Dr. Jill Biden. Thank you, Dr. Lynch, and the staff, and thank you to the staff here at Fred Hutch for hosting me here today. You know, of all the things that cancer steals from us, time is the coolest. And we can't afford to wait another minute for better solutions or better treatments, better cures. And that's why my husband, Joe Biden, and I uh, reignited the Biden Cancer Moonshot, our White House initiative to build a world where cancer is not a death sentence, where we stop cancer before it starts, where we catch it early and help people live longer, healthier, happier lives. Where we invest in innovative research and help patients and their families navigate this journey. For survivors, that journey doesn't end when they are declared cancer free. Side effects from treatment and the constant fear of that next doctor's appointment linger through remission. We all know that. We all know people who experience that. But with research and the right care for survivors, we can mitigate those side effects and help ease those fears. And that's what's happening right here at Fred Hutch, where researchers are working to prevent breast cancer from coming back and metastasizing in survivors. And where clinicians are supporting survivors with quality care that's designed to meet their unique needs. There are 18 million cancer survivors across our country. And thanks to the amazing work that's being done right here, you know, we are adding to that number each day. And as I've traveled the country and the world, I've seen innovative programs and partnerships that are making progress. I've seen what is possible when we invest in cutting-edge research. 
And I've seen that there is so much hope to be found. And so I saw that hope here today as well. You know, your work will change lives and save lives. And through the Biden Cancer Moonshot, we're putting American innovation to work for patients. And together, we will help make it so that the word cancer loses its power. So fewer families know the pain of losing a loved one to this disease, as Joe and I have. That's the reason we're all here. That's why I'm asking you to lean in just a little bit more, to push your staff just a little bit harder for all the families touched by cancer across the country that are in a race against time. That is the urgency of now. And for Joe and for me, this is the mission of our lives. And we are ready and we are proud to work beside you. So I look forward to hearing all of your insights today and take the stories back to the White House so that others can benefit from your expertise. So thank you again for having me here. Thanks.
hopefully the federal investment in the uh, NIH to help support the development of new therapies as well as funding for survivorship research. Uh, and of course, also grateful to the patients and families who have trusted us with their care <coughs> throughout the course of their cancer journey um, and who purchased it. <laughs> so I just want to say, thank God that there are doctors like you who are treating young patients. And most recently, uh, I saw the uh, young cancer patients that we brought here uh, from Ukraine because all these kids, you know, they needed help. They needed their hospitals were non-existent, and and we have the best care here. So we brought those kids over, and um, you know they're doing well. But, um, Thank you. Dr. Biden, let me introduce you to a fellow teacher and also first year for survivor, Leah Markow. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, thank you for letting me share my story. My name is Leah Marco, um, and I'm a teacher. I'm a mom. It's a wife. It's a kindergarten teacher. Love that. And a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. And, you know, it is the teams that make the difference. Absolutely. You know, that help you through it all. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great story. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 